first like introduction of interview and interview. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the It's My Job podcast. This is Jose. I am a transition student from Colorado, and my teacher, Ms. Christine Dolly, is the podcast facilitator. The It's My Job podcast features students interviewing adults who are blind or visually impaired, asking them important questions like how they use technology and how they connect with other people. Stay tuned after the podcast to hear how to get involved, and please share with your friends and teachers so they can listen too. Now for the interview. James from Colorado is interviewing Jen. Jen is a current gold ball medalist, and she is currently working in the Portland State University. Now, let's listen to James's interview with Jen. Next slide picture of Jen. Can you tell me about yourself? Sure. Um, so I grew up overseas most of my life, but came back stateside for middle school and high school. Um, my dad was in the Air Force. I have two older sisters. Yeah, kind of came from an athletic background, played sports sort of all my life when I was sighted. And then after I lost my vision as well. I, be- I bet it's pretty fun being an athlete when you were much younger. Yeah, for sure. Basketball was sort of my my go-to sport and what I was supposed to sort of go to college on. Right before my freshman year is when I started having uh, my vision issues and went legally blind. was able to uh, still play actually basketball up until I went total my senior year in high school. But at that point, I'd actually got introduced to the sport of goalball and had made the U.S. team. So that was kind of good from a transition standpoint because sports was just such a big part of my life as far as kind of all my aspects from time management to keeping my grades up <laughs> to be able to play sports nice. and things like that. So it was probably good that I was able to transition. So nice. So uh, what type of education do you need to perform this job? My particular one had a minimum of a bachelor's, but I have my master's as well and had been working in the field of adaptive sports for 20 years. My actual degrees are not in recreation whatsoever, but I was a sociology criminal justice major and then my master's is in criminal justice as well. But like I said, I've been working in sports administration and adaptive sports for over 20 years. What caused you to lose your sight? Um, So I have bilateral optic neuritis um, at age 14. Um, So I have a vision of my right eye and then three months later, my left eye was attacked. Their best guesses at that point were viral or radiation exposure because we were overseas when Chernobyl blew and had Mm. pretty significant fallout. And then um, three years later, um, I went total in a matter of about four hours. And how do you adapt with this change? Like I said, it, it was it was interesting because for the three years I was stable and legally blind, I was left with basically peripheral out of my left eye um, mm-hmm. and no night vision. So I used a cane somewhat at night, but for the most part, I used my peripheral vision, large print, um, CCTV um, to do my homework, those type things. And then when I went total, like I said, it was my senior year in high school um, in about four hours and a day before we left for the Barcelona games in 92. <laughs> so I missed my uh, first two weeks of my senior year because I was over in Barcelona competing at the games. So when I got back, I actually, I had enough credits. So I actually had to drop my last two hours, my physics and my calculus class to do some different O&M mobility training and uh, just some daily living skills stuff before I was going off to college um, and just working with screen readers and things like that, that I hadn't really worked with before because I was using CTV, CCTVs. Um, so that adaptation came um, pretty quickly in my senior year and just working pretty intensely with making sure I got the screen reader um, support that I needed. I knew I still know some minimal Braille as far as like labeling and things like that, but I was not a, a Braille user at all through high school or even through college. I really didn't pick it up and I'm not super fast at it now. Um, but when my niece was born, I was working at Western Michigan University and they have an O&M and vision, uh, a TVI program up there. And they were looking for some students were looking for hours to teach Braille to someone. So I volunteered <laughs> um, and my niece was like, too. So I wanted to be able to read to her, picked up my, my, my Braille skills a little bit more efficiently, um, you know, later um, for sure. Still don't use it a lot. My adaptations, even through sport and daily living has really been what I call cheap and easy. So it's doing different things like just putting toothpicks, you know, on the markers for the, the stove and or the washer dryer or making sure I get tactile um, appliances in my house or just putting, you know, tactile dots on something real quick for the five on the microwave or something like that. Yeah. And I use, like I said, I use, I'm a JAWS user. So I'm a JAWS user and I'm an Apple. Did you have a TV, uh, TVI? I, yeah, I had an itinerant. So I actually, I went to high school in Colorado at Falcon school district. So I was the first, uh, blind student to go through my district, um, in district 49, but so I did my itinerant teacher out of OCs. So they came out and like I said, for those two hours a day, once I went total, I really wasn't doing a lot of services prior to then because I had my own CCTV and those type things, but I had those two hours. Like I said, we worked with O&M because um, I'm a guide dog user. The, my last dog is actually COVID dog. We came home early because we were there when we shut down. Uh, did you transfer any skills from basketball to goalball? And if so, how long did it take you to get the concept of goalball? For sure. I mean, basketball was my main sport, but I also played volleyball. I was a softball pitcher and a soccer goalie. I transferred probably actually a lot of skills from different sports into to goalball. Um, as you know, I mean, you played a 
little bit. I mean, your your defense is very much like a soccer goalie. So yeah, yeah, for sure. The lateral movement, um, the power, the and those things for sure transferred. You know, from the different sports, whether it's basketball or volleyball. I, I know the first time I played goalball actually was in at the school for the blind in Carver Springs. Wait, so it, you actually started here? I I never went to school there. But you played go ball. You played go ball over here. I have, and we used to have tournaments there every year. And I started really? vacation camps there years ago. Um, wow! Yeah, so I'm pretty interesting. Pretty I did not know that. Yep, wow. that's cool. So, yeah, so that was my first. So even like now, when I play goal ball, my because remember I had a little bit of vision, so my right. mental visualization is still the old gym upstairs. Yeah, that was my first because uh, they wrote an article about me playing basketball, being legally blind in the Gazette. And uh, Lynn Flea Hardy, who used to work at the school, called me up and said, "Do you want to start this? Do you want to try this game called goal ball?" And I'd never heard of it before, but it had a ball in it. So um, my dad and I um, went down there, and uh, Lynn threw me on the court a little bit, and I said, well, "I think you should have pads for this game." Um, so he gave me some. We found some elbow pads, and then he actually gave me a. Uh, my dad and I a key to the gym. Oh, um, nice. And so my dad actually coached the Colorado team from 90 on. Interesting. Yeah. Fun time doing goal ball here at the school then. Oh yeah, for sure. So, okay. Uh, can you tell me some of the challenges that you have when you're raising kids and uh, what accessibility tools do you use to help you live independently and take care of your own, your house? Um, I mean, talked a little bit about like some of the things that obviously I do with the appliances and things like as far as a lot of the adaptations. Um, and I'll start with the kids type thing. It, it was interesting um, on how verbal probably our kiddo was. Grunting and pointing wasn't going to work for him. So he became pretty vocal pretty quickly as far as what he wanted, <laughs> which made it nice. He probably got his butt wiped extra, extra, extra good just because I was paranoid of it, um, <laughs> just to make sure. So I think the most adaptations, honestly, I really came a little bit later with him, especially like this last year and a half with COVID and using right. the IRAP to like double check his homework and things like that, because basically we were a parent, a teacher, everything. So yeah, definitely use the IRA app to double check some of his homework and things like that. So that's been pretty good. Um, the other things too, that's been awesome really with the IRA app is he's an avid swimmer. So to be able to go to meets, and be able to just flip that on and be able to follow his races. If I wasn't, you know, by another parent or somebody else that was, you know, there to commentate and things like that. Then my technology, for sure. I mean, I use my scanner quite a bit. Obviously, I use my technology and I'm in communication with, you know, his teachers and things like that all the time via email um, with all of our kids. Um, you know, we have a teenager now as well. So that's been fun. Like I said, I, I mean, I use a lot of tactile appliances and things like that when I when I buy things. For, I would say I'm really well organized. I don't have things labeled great in my house as far as um, my clothing and things like that, but I'm, but they're still, they're organized. So they're not labeled, but they're organized. So as long as the organization system is in check, which with kids is not always the case. Um, so the spice cover gets messed up and things like that. But but I rely a lot on my memory, to be honest, um, more than I do the labeling. And for 25, 30 years, my wardrobe consisted of USA everything. So that pretty much matches, um, you know, each other and things like that. So I'm trying to think, like I said, I think my, my technology is probably the biggest thing. And like I said, just labeling a few things that I needed to more so again with, with the kiddo. As far as barriers go, I, I don't know it's barrier. I mean, I use public transit, obviously, all the time. Living in Portland has been nice because we have the, you know, the light rail system, the buses. So my kiddo's have grown up on public transit. So that's, I don't, it's not a barrier. It's, it's frustrating because you can't get to places as quickly as you would like to get to places sometimes, you know, with, with route planning and things like that, it's just never going to be as quick as, you know, jumping in the car and going. Um, right. So, so I think the, you know, the biggest adaptation is just the, the planning that has to go into it. Part of the thing too, and where we're living and, and different things, we just made another move a couple of years ago, just to be in a better school system for him. So he can have walking distance to a school and he can actually have a, a, a neighborhood to play in where when he was little, that wasn't a big deal. Um, so I was a little bit closer to public transit to get into my work. We're now I'm a little bit further commute, but it's better for the kids where we're at. But we also found a place, you know, where we can walk everywhere. So we can get to the, to the grocery store. We can get to all those things via foot or nice. the bus, if you know, and, and things like that. So I think that's the biggest adaptation it's just been kind of the planning around I think the, the probably the biggest barrier honestly is the public I think especially like when he was little and you'd go out of the house and you know you had the the burp stain on your shoulder probably any mom does but being more self-conscious of it because everybody wants to chalk it up to the, oh you, you must not know that you have it on there because you're blind or you must not know your kid has spit up on no I know my kid has spit up on him he's eight months old <laughs> it's like that's what happens right but she's kind of getting over that piece of it because I think that the public wants to chalk everything up as your blindness versus just that's part of being a parent <laughs> like you're gonna have spit up on you you're gonna get that's part of, of parenthood yeah in what ways did you did you overcome challenges that you encountered um, like I said, planning and, and working, uh, you know, I'm remarried and stuff now too, is in working with each other and our, just our family on what works for all of us. But I think that the biggest challenge like I said was, was moving to a place where public transit allowed me the freedom to be able to, to go where I wanted to go when I needed to go, you know, or be able to walk to the store. If I needed something at 11 o'clock at night, I could get there, which is 
it's hard for me because I mean, as much I I would love to live a little bit more out in the country and those kind of things, but that's not realistic as far as for my independence to do that. Right. So I think getting over this challenge is really for me was you know just settling in that city life was going to be okay to so just really embrace you know public transit and and getting that piece of it. But then also the, the other thing probably for me as far as dealing with challenges is my stress level. So just having the outlet to go cycling or go running or, or doing those kind of things and just having those avenues to be able to do that is a little bit easier to you in a little bit more populated place. Like you said, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit on the older side. So technology has definitely made it a little bit easier as well, <laughs> I think, to to get to some things, you know, where, you know, you'd have to, I mean, I can flip on Ira real quick or give him a call. You know, if I get stuck in something real quick or I can use the Seeing Eye mobility app real quick to check out an intersection that might be unfamiliar or the Google Maps. Like there's just so many things now that are, it's so much quicker, I think. I mean, not that it wasn't doable 25 years ago. I mean, I navigated then as well, you know, in Huntsville, Texas of all places, you know, but I think that the overcoming challenges can happen a little bit quicker with technology now than what accommodations does uh, your recreational facility provide for those who are dis- who have disabilities? So I was hired on as obviously the inclusive rec coordinator. So we try to do a lot of universal design. So when we buy new equipment, we make sure the stuff's tactile and things like that. So the dumbbells are, you know, have the tactile numbers on them that are large. Our, we're also color coded, like when we bought new kettlebells and things like that. Cardio equipment, rather than having the flat screen, touch screens things, we actually go with the older school consoles that are tactile. The pre-course, so the center buttons, you know, tactile, boom, the top goes up bottom goes down. We've went in and put tactile um, braille labels for up, down, and quick start on 90% of our cardio equipment. We still have a few things that were flat screen, touch stuff that were there before I got there and things like that. All of our dumbbell racks are also labeled in braille. Our stacks are all um, tactile there. Um, On the uh, mobility side of things, we put in a lot of cable stations so folks can come up, they can roll up in a wheelchair if they want to. They can stand, they can sit on a BOSU ball, they they can just do different, they're just more universal design. Um, so they can do multiple different exercises. We do have like a wide weight bench in there for wheelchair users to be able to, to transfer onto for bench press and those things. Instead of the exercise mats on the floor, we actually got the elevated T mats. So folks, again, from chairs can transfer onto those tables and or even just people that don't feel comfortable being on the ground, you know, or maybe um, are in larger bodies or th- different things that just getting on the ground is not comfortable um, or maybe an orthopedic impairment. Um, so we have those at a higher level. So you can do that. Um, when we bought our recumbent bikes, we don't have to flip your leg over the top. You can, it's just a walkthrough thing. So if you have any kind of impairment there, we only have two pieces of actual adaptive equipment in our rec center because we really are focused on the universal design piece which is the wide bench that I told you about. And then we have the new step machine, which ha- allows all four limbs to be in motion if only one is functional. So you can strap in legs or arms and things like that. So somebody might have a stroke, they might have it. Um, so all the muscles are still being fired, even if only one can work and things like that. We have obviously lifts in our pool, into our hot tub. You know, we have some different, you know, our, our staff training, um, they go through some pretty extensive training. Um, with how to guide properly, you know, do transfers and things for folks in chairs. You know, we offer goal ball at the at, at Portland State. We offer um, wheelchair basketball. Um, we do a variety of actually wheelchair sports. Um, we have the soccer ball, so we've we've done um, blind soccer and stuff. Yeah, and then we work directly with the the rec clubs to do like we've had adaptive rowers in our crew club, our baseball team. Like so, we make adaptations where we need to in our within our rec clubs and intramurals programs as well. That's interesting. I've never. Hey, seen- you want to come to Portland State? <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> sounds like the complete inclusive there yeah that's that's what that's what we strive for yeah and like i said i i started as adaptive rec i changed it to inclusive rec because um again like our sore goal ball um isn't just for vision impaired and blind anybody can play so we've always right. had sighted players on our team as well at our college level um and, and things like that same with our wheelchair basketball those are our two most popular that's why i mention those two all the time <laughs> and volleyball sit volleyballs sit volleyballs catching up there becoming pretty popular as well. The pandemic though kind of shut everything down. So now we have to regrow all our programs back. <laughs> so. It'll take time, but we'll get we'll, we'll yeah, there eventually. Absolutely. So so when you started at the uh, university, what position did you start in and what are your professional goals after your current position? So like I said, I started as the adaptive rec and community outreach coordinator at campus rec. Now I'm still so I'm the inclusive rec and fitness center coordinator. So I oversee our whole gym now as well as our inclusive program actually specifically Honestly, I am really comfortable with the university where I'm at because I love, so I supervise about 35 students, which I absolutely love. You know, the next level up, you get into a lot of administrative stuff and you don't get as much hands-on with students. And that's not my thing. <laughs> so I'm very much hands-on. So honestly, I, if I go anywhere professionally, I'd probably be more just into another sports arena. Um, rather, that's working for a different nonprofit 
that focuses on recreation and sports for folks with disabilities. That's where my passion lies, is, is just getting folks active. Like I said, you don't have to be competitive or whatever, but just being active and getting off the sidelines and just for your overhaul, join a community, you know, and, and get active in things. So I will always probably be in that line of work, whether that's at Portland State or that's, you know, at a different organization. But I mean, I've been at Portland State now for 11 years. So how do you adapt to schedule change and how do you navigate like a new city when you go to you know, game somewhere? For schedule changes, like I said, I mean, I travel all the time. So time changes and those kind of things have never really kind of bothered me or the adaptation to, to, to schedules um, and being pretty flexible because things change. Just like I thank you guys for being flexible today um, when my schedule changed. So that's ad- adapting that way is, is fairly easy. Um, as far as going into new cities um, and things like that, I, I, I absolutely will use my technology route you know, route guide and, and do some things like that if I need to. And I, I still a lot of old school. I will, I mean, if there's somewhere I need to be, I will absolutely ask for directions or use my technology to get there. If it's a city and I just want to explore, that's what I do. Um, I, I have full faith in all the dogs I've ever worked. So I'm pretty, pretty confident in my O&M and my navigation with my dog that will always be safe with what we're doing. So a lot of times I'll just go explore, to be honest, and just kind of see what's around me. And I have no problem opening doors and seeing what kind of shop it is, <laughs> you know, or whatever those kind of things, if, if, if it's more of a fun trip. And again, if it's like I have to be somewhere, you know, specifically, um, you know, if I'm in San Francisco and need it on the BART system, you know, I'm going to look up the times and the rails and, you know, stations and, and do the pre-planning things that I need right. to make sure I'm not, you know, late for meetings and things. But so I think it just depends on whether it's recreational or if it's more business that I'm traveling on. Um, and there's sometimes when I'm traveling, you know, when I'm traveling with the U.S. team, I, my guide dog does, did not go because my focus needed to be on my team, um, you know, what we were doing over Finland or Madrid or wherever we were at. And so, I, you know, I used to side, I used to guide and, you know, would go off other teammates and slash coaches and things. So, so yeah, I think it just kind of depends on the situation. But yeah, I have pretty pretty full confidence in my dog um, and he loves hiking too so that's kind of nice um, so nice. i can put his little booties on and go explore outdoors too on pretty rugged stuff cool yeah. and as i understand um uh, you are a seven time paralympian correct correct yeah 92 were my first games and then i retired after rio paralympics one gold one silver two bronze world championships two gold two bronze one silver the sports changed so much right you know when i when i started in 90 i mean like i said my dad got into it my, my dad's coached sports his whole life i mean he coach varsity sports and air force teams and kids and everything like that. So did my mom, you know, I was under a different U S coach when I first started, you know, it was kind of a throw out the ball and scrimmage um, where when my dad kind of took over the Colorado team, but then took over the U S team, it was drill, 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 just like you would basketball or anything else. He developed the, you know, the drills and the different things and really, you know, brought in the, the testing and, and those kind of things from a high performance level. You know, the U S teams obviously were, you know, the women were successful again um, this year, you know, in Tokyo, which is pretty awesome. You know, the, the coach, you know, was his assistant coach coach, you know, in Rio. So, you know, and what five, I'm the only one that didn't return. So I was the only one that retired. So they had five of the six of us from Rio, um, in the sport and same with like Mary Bai and Amanda, they were all sports camp kids, um, that grew right. up, you know, cause I used to run the sports education camps around the country. So it's been wow. fun to watch those kids not be kids anymore. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and, and watch them just take it same with the guys team. You know, a lot of those are, are sports education camp kids, um, that have just grown up through the system and it's been definitely fun to watch. Interesting. As a blind individual, um, did you like, when you went, uh, cycling, did you use a standard two wheel? Uh, I mean, I can, but I, I race. So I use a tandem Nice for racing, but yeah, I mean, I can still ride a two wheel and still do like when I mess around with my kiddo and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, no, we race. Um, so yeah, I race tandems now. Nice. Oh so, yeah. So. Um, so how did you get the balance to ride two wheel single? I think part of it, I, I mean, I grew up riding one. So I, I had probably some of that natural balance anyways. Um, but I'm not going to lie. Like the first time I really got back on it when I was total was definitely different. <laughs> I was like, okay. You know, so it was just like when I first learned to write, it was just um, getting that balance. Um, it was really practicing. And honestly, I, the safest I did was when I taught my kid, which I took him out to an open field. So if he fell over, it wasn't going to be road rash city um, and things. So we went to a local track and I you know, took him out on the infield and then got him out on the track. Um, so doing that part of it, just feeling safe, um, you know, before we got onto the concrete and things right. like that. So, but yeah, so I think just you know, being in a, an environment where you feel comfortable enough that you're, if you're going to fall, you're going to fall. Um, but anybody that's learning to ride a bike, that that's part of the natural progression is you're going to fall. Um, so as right. long as you so, understand that, <laughs> right. so, that's going to happen, you know, um, 
as a blind individual who had who didn't grow up writing a two wheel bike, yep. which I didn't. Yeah. Um, is it possible for me to for like someone who's who's been basically blind pretty much all their life to be able to ride a two wheel, or is it going yes. to take a little bit longer? Absolutely. Yep. But it's going to be just like practicing, just like if you were younger. It's going to take practice, and like you said, you got to be willing to. You're going to hit the ground probably, and that's okay. Wouldn't surprise um, me. Exactly. Um, I mean, I, I taught there. So I did a, a one year long term substitute position there in Cowder Springs mm-hmm. at the school. And I taught boys PE, boys health and four math classes because math was oh, my thing. Um, but yeah, our PE class, that was my thing. I mean, if you bled, you got extra credit. So that's all good. Nice. So, <laughs> but, um, so um, but yeah, no, I definitely have seen folks that do it. But like I said, it's going to take some practice. Um, and to me, it's like I said, it's no different than anybody learning to ride a bike. Um, you know, whether you're a, a teenager, an adult, or you're a kid, there's going to be steps and progression that's going to happen and working on balance. And I think there's different ways to, to get that balance. I mean, they have the balance bikes now that don't have any pedals on them, that all you're doing is pushing and then just trying to regain that balance before you even get the pedaling in, you know, to adding pedals to. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's different ways, I think, to, to get that balance. Nice. Piece you know, to the old school of someone holding the seat while you do it and run alongside you and let you go, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, yeah. So I think there's different ways to do it, but yeah. I was going to, uh, so before we go, do you have any questions for me? Um, so what year are you in school, dude? I actually, uh, recently just graduated. Oh, did you from Power Springs or? Yeah. I graduated out of the school, the CSTB. Okay. Awesome uh was it last year was it the keynote when was it when jesse did the keynote lorenz or i was uh, i graduated uh, june 4th of 21 of this of year. 20 of this year oh, okay yeah I, I think she did the keynote in 2020 yeah <laughs> i graduated yeah. this year this year all right cool yeah. so what are your plans um i'm looking into getting a job at for like it tech support i'm yep looking into some of those. I've applied for some positions. Unfortunately, I have to work with my resume and kind of fix that so it matches the job descriptions. And yeah. um, hopefully with that in mind, I can hopefully get a job somewhere. Awesome. Are you from Cowboy Springs then? Or? No, I'm actually from Aurora. Okay, so you're from up in the Denver area. Yeah. All right. Awesome. That's my sister, oldest sister used to live in Aurora for years. Now they live up in Longmont. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank you, James. Thank you for thank you so much for taking time to do this. Of course. I appreciate it. No problem. Newslight, how to contact us. Hi, it's Jose again. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the It's My Job podcast. What do you think? Would you like to be a global athlete? If so, let us know by posting a comment on our Facebook or email address is askitismyjob at gmail.com. Are you new to the It's My Job podcast? If so, welcome. We want you to know that you can find us on Facebook. Just search for It Is My Job. Each of our episodes is on the perkinslearning.org slash technology. Finally, We have a YouTube channel called It Is My Job. If you missed episode number 24, head over to YouTube or Facebook to hear my interview with Penn Street, a current podcaster for the Audio Information Network. This was our 25th episode, but we want to make many more. If you are a student who is blind or visually impaired and would like to be an interviewer, send us a message on Facebook or email and we will match you up with an interviewee. We have a lot to be thankful for in this episode. News like with credits. Thanks so much, James and Jen for taking his time. This podcast is facilitated by my teacher, Miss Christine Dolly. Thank you, Miss Dolly, for providing students with meaningful opportunities and to experiment with what you always tell us. You don't need sight. You need a vision. Thanks to Perkins Path for technology vlog for the vlog posts. Our music is from purpleplanet.com. We hope that this podcast is a great opportunity to learn from each other and increase awareness about all the amazing jobs that are being done by people who are blind or visually impaired.